We're all about great causes here at Sex and Space, and today's shout out is certainly a worthy one. It's for an organisation called HA. They develop education programmes that teach the history of Aotearoa. They use art to explore our history and imagine our future. HA is founded on Te Reo Māori values, which guide them to deliver safe and inclusive education programmes. Check them out at facebook.com history of Aotearoa. They are Ash's shout out of choice today. Sex, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the speculative interdimensional vehicle, Sex in Space. Its mission, to explore new points of view, to seek out fresh opinions, to boldly go where so many have gone before, and still somehow manage to totally miss the point. Subscribe to Sex in Space wherever quality podcasts are found. Hello, I'm Jess. Hello, and I'm Tim. And welcome to Sex and Space. This is our mega project, of course, that explains... Explains? I don't know if it explains anything. I don't know if it does either. I'm going <laughs> to... Go with no, it. No, it does not explain it. It explores sex across all of its infinite dimensions. And aims to turn the awkward into the straightforward and hopefully have some fun while we're at it. Indeed. Today we have an interview which Jess and I did with Ash Holwell. He's a dad uh, and a community builder based in Poor Nicky, which is Wellington. Uh, he has roots in Fungaray, where he ran for office as a Green Party candidate. In Fungaray he's started up uh, 116 uh, Tefari Bike and founded Youth Theatre Initiative, The Company of Giants, with Laurel... Divini. Divini. Yeah. Good surname. Uh, his business is called Space Lamp, investing in urban space to uplift projects, working for good. Uh, his biggest passion project to date is raising baby Indigo as a non-binary gender with Indigo's mum, Sarah. That was a really mm. cool interview. Ash is a super chilled out and very interesting guy. Mm. Um, yeah, hope you love it. Uh, let's dive in. And now, the interview. Yes, thank you so much for coming thank in. Thank you for coming. Cool. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. It's been an experience already. It's great. Yeah. Mm. So what's brought you to this moment with us being here yeah <laughs> um i get asked i gotta probably had some referrals through friends around what we're trying to um i don't know not what we're trying to do it's just our take our take on um indigo's upbringing in some ways and some mm. i think there's lots of um things that are important to me and sarah um indigo's mum sarah uh about their upbringing and maybe some of them are Unusual to our current society, and lots of them aren't as well. Lots of them are standard as. Yeah, because how would you define what you're doing? So, um, so we're here to talk to you really about your your parenting style with Indigo, and is there a way that you would describe that? Um, I don't know if we have a particular name for it. I guess it just stems from beliefs around gradient, or not even a gradient of gender, like a field of genders and gender identities, and. Um, there being it just been quite I probably can use the word disgusting exactly how um fed into or directed into young people are into one or another gender basically and um yeah done lots of reading or maybe not lots but enough reading around it to be like find it quite hilarious like um do you know the original color for boys was pink mm -hmm. and that was only in the 1930s strong pink color for boys like a hot and a pink soft or like a I don't know exactly. I guess whatever okay. they could make with the dice at the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, soft, soft blue for the girls, and that was kind of 1930s. Mm. Um, and then now it's obviously quite different, which kind of is a, it just means it's, it seems like a hilarious fast to me. Yeah. Um, but lots of other, other reasons as well. And um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and people treat, I mean, adults. Lots differently based on their gender, and that's even kind of somewhat more pronounced from some of the research I've read for young people. So, um, just being conscious of that, and like it's kind of like keeping the opportunities open for Indigo in terms of the experience of life that they have. Um, it's probably, yeah, somewhat, I guess, 
some of our own my own beliefs around stuff, but that would be kind of one of the driving forces around Indigo's opportunity to still have space for being who they might be mm. and not having it closed off too soon. So is too in soon, that, whatever. <laughs> is that experiencing all for for Indigo? Is that what you're trying to... Um, for all genders. Well, every... Are you trying to give them a, a, a sort of taste of everything or a taste of just neutrality? How? I mean, I'm... I'm a, Mm. I am honestly so interested, um, but at the same time, like I've just questions um, around the logistics and, but yeah, just fundamentally, we just start with the sort of the values of what you're trying to do. Like, how how did you come to even think this was something you were going to attempt? Um, I guess we have a um, pretty massively patriarchal society for the last say 7,000 years in the Western world anyway. Um, and one way of reasserting that power is by naming that difference con- consistently and remaking it and reiterating that that difference um, and that word and that labelling throughout our society. Um, and so obviously lots of people have been doing lots of work um, probably for 7,000 years and I guess particularly lots of it in the Western world over the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years in terms of like be- shifting our understandings in the West of what gender is and how much of a field it is rather than a binary. Mm. Um, and that's doing some deep kind of work in, um, I guess, absurd, more like subverting that power dynamic because it can't be there if it's not kind of named or there isn't uh, entities to put into a hierarchy to begin with. Um, and I guess like well, my understanding of kind of genders as well well actually the naming of things is interesting like in the western world i've i guess i've studied lots of um sociology of science and one of my favorites of sociology of science is that it's literally in the 1660s the idea of fact was invented by the western world and so it took about 10 years and there was a scientific argument in england in london around um I guess in, within the development of science and within 10 years the actual concept of a fact was invented so it's a technology that we invented at some point point. Um, and obviously we're seeing in a society a little bit of a re-questioning or uh, almost the end of fact in some ways because it doesn't actually if fact isn't seen as the truth then does it even matter if it's a fact or what is that what is the mm. power of that word anymore and so um, I'm pretty open to being dubious about not dubious but like why do we believe something it doesn't necessarily it's always has an argument behind it or has a history or it has a lineage why we might believe something and knowing why it's there is really important for us you know we just kind of believe in things for mm. whatever reason mm. and so if you i guess if by putting that same lens on gender myself and digging into it a little mm. bit it seems like pretty kind of um ad hoc at best (laughs) Um, and yeah and how much of a field it is how much it's utilized more for as a power dynamic than actually what it is what the actual truth or fact or whatever the experience of it might be Mm. and um I was thinking about this earlier that it would be hilarious talking about a Venn diagram on a podcast but if you took a Venn diagram and still even believed in our standard male and females and you then like basically the circles would fully overlap except for two tiny little bits at the edges. And so the differences within genders or within what we might currently say are genders is much bigger than the difference between genders. Mm. And we're just missing out on a whole level of understanding because Mm. of that. Because if you think the Venn diagram is quite different and everyone's like those circles are quite small, then you kind of just miss out on who people are. You know, I'm sitting here with um, two dads and I'm just fascinated in what non-binary parenting looks like practically. Like what? Like are you fascinated by this too, uh, Tim? Massively, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I don't know how yeah. you choose to answer that, but yeah, I, yeah. For me, I mean, it, it, I think I've sort of thought about it a little bit, and there's so much that I'm sort of not in control of uh, culturally. You know, that's coming at my children, right. and. Um, mm-hmm. 
yeah, how to how to deal with that, how to bat that away, or do you do you bat it away? Yeah, that that kind of thing. I think there's the intentional stuff, and then there's the rest of it, right? Yes. So, yeah. What mm. is your blueprint? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we I, there's a couple in the states who are. Um, I guess they're doing it hardcore, <laughs> right. that where no one knows the um, anatomy of their child, basically, or maybe a very small, but it's not. And so, and they're very um, intense on it. It's an amazing that they've been a bit of an inspiration, I guess, mm-hmm. in terms of what they've, how they've gone about it and how they're extremely intentional about it. Are they in on Instagram team. or anything? Is that something yeah, it's that called Raise, Raising Zuma. Raising um, Zuma. Yeah. So, and, but actually there was one, um, Mo, I'm on post, I think, a little story about how they deal with people asking Zuma's gender. Mm-hmm. So often it'll be to the, now the child's a bit older now, will be to the child. The child will go back, I'm a Zuma, is often what they say. I'm a Zuma or I'm a, I'm a human. Yeah. Sorry, not wanting to put Zuma's accent in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then they will ask the parent and then the parent will go back to the child. And I think that was a, more than necessarily the gender thing, that was a cool moment of being like that responsibility back to the child to, mm. to answer and almost like another being like ridiculous to the other person who's asked. It's like you've already asked the question, you've had an answer, why are you asking me as a parent for the actual answer? Just trust the child. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that, that was a, that's a very cool moment. That, and I think that's been a bit of a, um, that was a nice moment to kind of experience that and outside of any gender stuff in terms of how much we enable Indigo to be a proper, like a valid person, valid human in the world. Like they've come to work stuff and they get, they came to um, another um, organization we were visiting and it was kind of imperative that we print out a name tag for Indigo. And then there's at the, at the co-working space that we work in, there's a, um, there's a wall for all the staff and then there's a kid's wall mm-hmm. and Indigo's genuinely on the staff wall and has a genuine um, role at Calibrate called the Vibe Dialer, which is very useful Brilliant. sometimes. It comes in for some specific meetings that are going to be hard work <laughs> and just keeps everyone level. <laughs> What's funny and, is that I cut that out of, I cut that out of your bio because Ash sent in this like very long poetic bio, which I believe was written by um, Ash's colleagues. And... <laughs> And I saw the words vibe dialer and thought it's an in joke. I don't understand what it is. And now I know. I'm so yeah. sorry that I didn't respect Indigo's no, that's a real job, yeah, real yeah, life yeah, yeah. job. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but um, regrets. I guess this is going going <laughs> past the little bit of the agenda stuff, but certainly part of like Indigo's experience of and our experience of them, like trusting them to be a whole human because they are a whole human in whatever way that is. And that, I guess, us us as older people to be in their world a bit more and a bit differently, um, which is, yeah, definitely, a, I guess, some sort of fundamental I'm trying to head towards. Mm. But back to, um, say, the Raising Zuma crew and the um, their kind of complete asking of others in terms of the referencing and big asking others to be on board with it has been pretty special and uh, yeah that's been cool i definitely haven't upheld that level of um rigidity in the um in i guess the non-binary approaches to indigo from other people and we're actually coming into an interesting time with that now because um there's lots of research around adults treating younger people differently based on what gender they perceive them to be the classics of um, people or young people being dressed in pink and dressed in blue, and then regardless of what their gender is, and then being tested around how what people expect of them, and they'll expect a lot more of um, the kids in blue. They'll ex- be more physical with them. They will. Um, um, I think there's an experiment around going up a slide and playing on a slide. They'll expect the the kids in blue to be able to do it much more and persevere with encouragement with the person in blue, whereas the person in pink will be allowed, not allowed, but you won't be expected that they're ever able to do it. And okay, just go off and do something else. And the way that mm. yeah, you're less physically active and there's different approaches um, mm. to the, the children and all the babies yeah. that are best dressed in blue and pink. And that being like a really, and from parents themselves, parents of their own children, 
like research of them treating their own children quite differently based yeah. on that. Um, and that being obviously a massive part of Indigo's experience of the world and growing up and mm. other people. Mm. And so um, my experience so far in terms of like asking people or telling people that we're using they is that there's normally a version of offence. Either they're offended or they think profusely that they've offended me or us and there's a little wall to get over. There'll be um, an argument, or sometimes they'll be into an argument. Sometimes um, it seems like a bridge too far to cross with someone. Like it's such an affront to who we are as Westerners that knowing someone's gender is such an immediate question for anyone. Mm -hmm. And that's why also like when someone walks into a room, the first thing that we all categorize in them is their agenda. We'll do it subconsciously like gender this gender that um um and so obviously that's needed when that's um less obvious in a young child the need to be assumed partly i think it's well it's definitely for our understanding codifying categorizing of the entire world and the safety of that and then i think our english language isn't that great it gives us him and her and not many other good ways to, Mm. to describe that um so there's the they, them, and multiple com- multiples or plural kind of confusion that happens. So it's just a safe place to have that pronoun reference for people. Um, and so because it's such a big thing, we've, I've been through a period of, yes, asking, and it has to be a bit of a practice because sometimes it's a, for me anyway, sometimes it's such a big mountain to seem to climb, mm-hmm. asking people or saying, hey, well, yeah, we're just using they, them with Indigo because it seems to like either break down that whole relationship straight away or it seems to be an affront to them or an apology, needing massive apology back. You know, oh, that's fine, it's okay. Um, that often if people assume Indigo's gender, whatever it will be, I will let them run with it because that's if coming from their, how they are treated by others, if they get a little bit of boy and a little bit of girl, then that's great. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You know, but we're just getting to the point now where Indigo's going to, start to understand or I think they probably will have already understood but now are getting to a deeper understanding and so kind of the time for that is basically over Mm -hmm. on their behalf Um, and so that's kind of a next layer that we're kind of or stage that we're getting to now which is um it's interesting it's easier to um have quite great scripts in your head about what you'd say and then what actually comes out in the time (laughs) is wildly different um because there seems to be such relationship risk in it, or such time risk. It's like, are we going to have to go all the way back here? And it seems like there's like such a massive bridge to cross for people in general, mm. society, yeah. or the world we live in in general, that it's like, either I just let this fly and don't worry, and it's not such a big thing, or we're going to be here for three hours. Mm. And yeah, I haven't quite worked out what the... Well, the best thing that was like, we're just using they, them for now is kind of like the most benign version of it. Yeah. Yes. Um, in my mind, I'm often asking people, oh, are you, when they're like, oh, is it boy or girl, are you asking about sex or gender? It's like, and I think that it would stump most people. Mm-hmm. And then getting to the point where like, well, literally people are asking about my baby's genitals. That's exactly right, yeah. That's what's going on mm. in that, at that moment. And you're like, there's no need for that. <laughs> <laughs> There's no need for that. Does it matter to you yeah. that much? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even though we know that that's not, there's that correlation is very loose. Our understand current understanding is that that correlation is very tight, and so therefore, if you're coming from that framework, then yes, you are asking about my child's genitals, and no need to know. Mm. There's lots of other things you could find out about them that are mm. far more interesting or pertinent. Or it's there is also an element of like aren't our imaginations better as humans? That, like, the first question you ask about someone is, like, about their assu- genitals and assumed gender. It's yeah. Like, there's lots more to indigo than that. Mm. Heaps more to find out. Do like, any people, like, not not ask? Do you get surprised when people don't? Like, does the majority do? Oh, uh, yeah, don't? lots of people don't ask, and then they've just, they're just using a him or her pronoun right, right away. Okay. And then sometimes they catch themselves as they're using it and need to check in if they're right or wrong. Which is also a little bit of a failure of our language that, like, there's no, like, I know in, I think in Swedish, there's hen, mm. which is a gender neutral pronoun that all schools are using now. Oh, and so you can, actually can't be wrong that. across a gradient or 
a binary. And so um, there's, there's a little bit of language defunct there in English um, that doesn't allow for that just to be like mm. not something that's asked. Yeah. Mm. Um, because it's so those pronouns are so used in our conversations that they need, it needs to be defined before you can have lots of English sentences unclunkily in some ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, lots of people do catch themselves. Like, uh, uh, because I think there's, when you're talking about the, the kind of scope of that version of parenting, the clothing is one of the most amazing experiences to begin with around, like, and that will be most people's experience of indigo is that they will be dressed neither in pink or probably actually more often blue than any, in the, if there was a colour, which is an interesting kind of like, not sure why, but also like, um, because it's so codified on lots of kids, mm. it's almost like being made easy for lots of, well, not made easy, but you know, just like mm. assumed a very assumptive can, can happen quite easily yeah. because it's like in all the op shops, even there's boys and girls clothing. Yeah. It's so amazing. That's so hilarious mm. that it's like that. Um, and then obviously in the shops, but even when it's like places like op shops and things like that, it's it's really interesting that it still has to be codified like that. Um, yeah. So at the point that, um, so I'm interested in in whether um, if indigo was to self declare gender, mm. when uh, is indigo verbal? Not quite not yeah quite. yeah a few okay. a few words and and it's definitely like months, so. sounds that are sentences mm -hmm. but they're not any words but the sentence <laughs> structure is perfect <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's yeah. Great. and you can have a beautiful a tonal conversation with them for sure we're not sure what's going on what's going on necessarily but it's it's a great <laughs> yeah, so. so i'm interested in whether the whether you're sort of um i guess waiting for indigo to self mm -hmm. declare and self-actualize in that way or um and also, so I've still got two questions. I've got that one, and I'm also interested in whether you see any disadvantages. I know um, even coming to this podcast to talk to you, I, I um, talked to a couple of friends who were parents, and they seemed very concerned about this choice. And, and so I'm interested in whether you yourself perceive any disadvantages to this kind of approach of parenting. Yeah. Mm. 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 For, for uh, Indigo. Yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting around the self declaring because it's it's kind of a little journey that maybe I've been on even recently around um and how you frame what that is in the mm -hmm. end. Is it a um a choosing, or is it yeah. a discovering, yes. or is it a an, a current understanding that will continue to shift in the yes. ability for that to to happen? Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I've heard it framed in other places of like our oh, choosing the gender, which I don't think is necessarily mm. everyone or anyone's experience. Um, and so there's that, there's, there is that discovery phase. And then there is also like a, there is a, um, it's almost like the only external need to declare at any, only need to declare at any point is an external need. You might just mm. be unnamed in somewhere in the gender pool <laughs> at some you know at all times and that might be shifting around constantly or in fairness could or, be internal some people could, feel they want yeah yeah totally right? yeah, yeah 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 if you identify as this and that helps through things yeah mm. yeah yeah or not through things but yeah that's part of the identity building mm. for sure mm. yeah yeah so i guess you don't know what indigo will do for that yet um and so not sh like i guess we get to the languaging point n n from now on um, in some ways for Indigo around how they describe them as and they them and, and you know obviously in the case of Zuma it's like I am a Zuma mm. maybe Indigo is a Indigo that's yeah. sweet um, maybe brilliant. Indigo is a human and mm. you yeah, know that's a human and a person and that's it thanks adult um, let's mm. move on to something more interesting yeah. <laughs> maybe I did, yeah we um, haven't fully worked that out yet cool. um, yeah I think I from what I know of Indigo so far in their confidence of other people and their clear ability to say no and yes to things. I'm quite confident they're on a pathway to being able to be very clear around that. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that will be a, um, a journey for all of us mm -hmm. involved. Yeah, I guess there's not a, there's not a guidebook for this, is there? So like as every step we take, every development Mm. Every every sort of stage, you are there to support Indigo. 
Mm. And as they may move or fluctuate or or just progress forward as a as a human, you know, you've got to be there to I think, probably to, to give them the right tools to to what um, be in the world, I guess. Mm. Yeah. To like, it's almost confronting the um, amount of respect. Hey, that's what I think. You know, just sitting here trying to grapple with the um, with it conceptually and kind of being like, I think. I think that's why other parents might struggle. Not being a parent myself, so, you know, <laughs> caveat there. But it is, it's an enormous amount of respect to afford a small person to be able to um, make decisions about or, or just continue to be in mm. the world exactly as they wish. Yeah. You know, and it, it's a radical amount of respect yeah. to offer to a, to a tiny human. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's my own... <laughs> lack of uh, sort of depth on this subject but I yeah there's kind of the idea that at some point there's going to be a choice mm. and it's like well, it doesn't have to be right it can you know you can just crack on with your life <laughs> yeah. and um, yeah it doesn't have to be okay right we're grown up now yeah I mean my mum went to a school where there was the boys' entrance and the girls' entrance. Oh wow! You know, yeah, like wow. two separate entrances to the yeah. same to the same school. Um, and Indigo would scale a fence. Uh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. That's or thing, walk right? in the like, other direction and be like, the amount see of um, <laughs> schools that are grappling with the um, change of like or unlabeling of gendered bathrooms and things at the mm. moment. Like, if you're looking at the trajectory of where young people are at now, say. The teenagers are at now, then you like gender kind of has a 30 year lifespan potential from one's perspective in the Western world. So, in some ways, I'm like, <coughs> there could be an argument that's like this is the most responsible way of parenting because we're setting in to go up for what the future is going to be like. Mm. There's that, that could be an angle as well. It's like it's completely irresponsible yeah. to go with a boy girl binary, binary gender yeah. um, upbringing for your child because that's not preparing them for the future that looks like it's happening fairly quickly. Yeah. Like that post-gender world is coming. I love it. Comparable to not having computers in your home. They're just <laughs> not going to be literate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting yeah, well, though, having two kids myself, nobody has ever asked what gender they are. And it, for, mm-hmm. to hear you sort of say, all these people, it's a constant stream of people, everybody that meets Indigo is, is asking what about their genitals effectively. Nobody's ever done that but of course they haven't because we probably you know they may look yeah yeah, I don't know they've they've got their little flags and now this a new temp arrives at Barbarella's the temporary therapist is here for their interview G send them in righto Tashi Delic, I'm Greg Pontig here at HR here at Barbarellis. Tashi Delic, I am Fecritus. I have interest in the temporary position recently advertised on Spacebook. Oh, yes. One of our operatives decided to spend a year upright. Do you have references? Well, here is a holodisc I have prepared. I am skilled at interspecies entanglement to level 9. I have a degree in coital posture from the University of Beta Centauri and an honorary tattoo from the Black Hole Riders of Proxima 4. Impressive. Do you have any questions for me? Well, there are rumors that some establishments have been substituting Never Dry for cheaper lubricants. I trust this isn't one of them. No! Nor will it ever be. Intercourse, whether social or physical, requires the very best in lubrication, Pecritus. For the latter, only Never Dry is good enough. And for the former? We run a full bar. When can I start? Will Fecritus find job satisfaction? Does the University of Beta Centauri have orientation week? Is coital posture an elective subject? Find out in the next episode. And now to more weapons grade content. Because at what point? Ten years old? At ten years old, you start usually a eh, the puberty starts to kind of kick in mm. and that's when people s- I'm just thinking I mean hopefully the ho- great hope is that in eight years that we've got a better 
that there's more people mm. that are thinking in a more mm. fluid way about gender so that it's not going to be... And they stop asking or... Yeah, yeah. That it won't be as challenging for Indigo. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Maybe um, I don't want to say post-gender world, post-binary gender world. Maybe yeah, yeah. clarification. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what is your hope for Indigo sex and gender education? Um... I mean, they're probably they're already getting it, but you know what I mean. Like, I guess, I guess, often when we ask that question, we're talking about school sex education, aren't yeah. we? A formal kind of nationalised mm. sex education. Ah, mm. um, uh, that it also acknowledges the gradient, and then therefore the field of relationships with people. Um, mm. I think we're, um, and I guess that's a lot through model modelling, and and this is my own take on it because I'm a. Um, I'm a very observational learner, like I learn through copying. And so, and this, this was through having a, um, a very kind of somewhat close, somewhat fraught, but very heartfelt relationship with my dad, who was very skillful making things, but a very untalkative relationship. Mm. So a lot of my upbringing um, and learning to do things was through observing my dad and then copying. And so I still retain that um, way of being able to learn is kind of like watching someone do something and then kind of being able to mimic it. Um, and so um I think in that modeling um, of those of healthy relationships is really important. Um and so and that's where lots I guess we get a certain amount of sex education at school which is like completely and utterly devoid at the moment of relationship and communication and all the things that actually make what relationships are. Um in lots of ways. And but most of it we get through osmosis and observation of others relationships which for lots of people is other people's parents your own parents and then suddenly all of these relationships that happen um in high school at some mm. point <laughs> mm. and so these these are your kind of models and i guess lots on tv and films and stuff so we just, we copying what those are um and they fit always fit as in a certain model at the moment in our western world even mm. probably somewhat more prescribed than gender at the moment is our binary versions of relationships you're very in a relationship or you're very out of a relationship and that's kind of it um and so i think there's uh, my aims are, are around that being a field for indigo as well in terms of the way that the types of relationships and the depths of the relationships and the physical interactions that people can have with each other are um, their own choice at each and every time and don't come with any assigned or pre prescribed rules um seems to me like the most fruitful opportunity for um, setting Indigo up to have healthy and useful relationships for them and others. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you mean choosing, so you're saying choosing in each moment kind of, is it? Yeah, choosing in each it? moment, knowing that like um, there are lots of different types of relationships you can have with people, just mm. like there are just different types of genders you might assign to or not, mm. um, mm. or um, assign to or um, identify with at any point in time, and those are they're all gradients as well and there's like a certain amount of skill that skill and tools and practice that goes with those types with all relationships so that we don't really get um so not certainly not formally in our um, education system and only some of us kind of get it in dribs and drabs from others whether they be parents or friends growing up in terms of like communicating with other people and mm self-responsibility in relationships and agreements between partners and things like that we yeah, don't yeah. get heaps of practice with. And so the, so kind of, in some ways, I feel like my haphazard practice of that is um, partly on Indigo's behalf to be able to have those conversations with them. Not by doing it just mm -hmm. because of them, but that gives a different impetus to those kind of things now, I think, in some ways, mm -hmm. knowing that it's upskilling to have those conversations that they might not get anywhere else. Mm. And mm. It's, it is, yeah, it's, I mean, the communication is the key thing, right? And um, I suppose they're already not playing out a kind of predefined cultural uh, narrative anyway. Um, mm. But that's going to be really interesting to how they can kind of communicate and articulate wants and needs and all those kinds of stuff and the, yeah. the future is going to be interesting I guess I'm kind of interested in what your did I just cut you off? no is <laughs> 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 it a breath or a word? Um, I'm interested too yeah, yeah. in what your sex education looked like mm. um, not just around gender obviously but just around everything because I think it's always interesting we all had such patchwork 
yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> versions of yep. what it is to be a sexual human. So, what, yeah, what does yeah. yours look, look like? I remember this health class at school that we all, I guess, lots of us experienced. That was that was what it was called. Yeah, health it was health class. class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, right up there with horticulture and those kind of like <laughs> illustrious subjects that the like, you know were always rewarded at the end of the year at the ducks. <laughs> but the ducks, you know, it's like it's the hierarchy of subjects is so interesting, and mm. health is right was right down the bottom in terms mm. of importance anyway, which is so absurd, really, when you think about you know. Even if you were just strategizing as a human race, you'd be like, oh, well, let's get health a bit further up there, eh? Yeah. But no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was the, you know, this, it was the class that everyone mucked around in and giggled got a lot. To giggle and yeah. did some exercises. And there was all this like build up of this certain class where they're going to talk about sex was coming and when it was going to happen, the rumors around it and stuff. And then it was kind of like the very practical basics and around putting condoms on and what STIs are and stuff like that. And then that's kind of it. So you, it sounds like you didn't learn about sex and pleasure and things from mm. through that formal education. So where did you, no. where did you accrue <laughs> that stuff? Um, I guess, again, in an ad hoc haphazard kind of manner over years of better and worse relationships or whatever they were. Um, or well, not whatever they were, but like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> I don't want to say better or worse. They were all kind of like experiences that led to some sort of learning and um, <laughs> even if that learning happened years and years later <laughs> um, <laughs> as the epiphany slowly rolled in. Yeah, they come in um, slowly but surely. And, and I guess from peers, like the people you're in relationships with mm. um, was kind of the biggest place that you learn from and often that's not the most fruitful place because you're also they're so loaded situations anyway yeah. that they're not and we were not necessarily equipped with the tools of having quite clear conversations with those people at the time or mm. even bothering to do it later necessarily. But then I guess maybe I've gone through, well, I definitely have gone through a much different kind of leap in terms of what I'm referring to now as the communication kind of tools and the um, relationship responsibilities and things in the last like, three years um, since kind of, you're starting to practice a bit of polyamory with um, some partners and kind of going through that initial experience with someone who um, I guess I met them at a time when I was believed in the fundamentals of it um, for lots of reasons, but hadn't had any opportunity to kind of practice it or do um, enter into in a relationship that um, either with anyone who also wanted to or had any experience with it. Mm. Um, so that was a kind of, I guess, the course of 2017 was a massive <coughs> journey for me in that, in terms of understanding um, the emotions I was experiencing, why I was experiencing them, whether they were um, even emotions or not, or you know the feelings to be had, um, where they were coming from, and rewriting for myself lots of the assumed um, narratives that we have in lots of our um, relationships in the Western world at the mm. moment around monogamy and lifetime partnerships and the one and um, uh, people being everything to someone else. Mm. Um, and I mean, those were kind of some of the things that I like intellectually I really understood before then is that that's an absurd, absurd amount of pressure to put on one person. Um, and, um, and, and also like, pressure in lots of ways and also just people aren't everything they don't also people are different they offer different things to you whether they be physical or not or like emotional intellectual and whatever it might be in the kind of supports and roles they play in your life and I guess I kind of understood that and then also um had my kind of at the moment chosen <laughs> understanding of the history of monogamy for the western world is that <coughs> Um, <clears throat> we as um, Western humans are often compared to, to chimpanzees as our closest ape relatives um, where it's actually the bonobos are much closer related to us so the chimpanzees are also much closer to our current kind of monogamous relationship um, narrative whereas the bonobos which are genetically much closer to us are deeply polyamorous and use it as a form of connection between um family groupings or not family like tribal groupings mm -hmm. um and sex mm -hmm. is a pastime genuinely kind of a pastime and part of the social fabric 
Um, and there's also a narrative around um, our own tribal kind of history where um, actually parental lineage of children wasn't a very necessary, like no one needed to know that for millions of years of our human development uh, because in a tribe or in that tribal society and versions of it, um, if everyone was looked after and you didn't actually know what ownership was and it was for the good of the group that everyone survived, there was actually no need to know who mum mm. and dad exactly were because um, everyone kind of was and everyone had equal kind of responsibility to everyone else mm. in that in that tribe. Mm. And then it was when the I guess the technology of ownership was invented and we started to settle and settle lands and stop being nomadic that we started to work on pieces of land that became more valuable over time. You, know, mm. you dig the ditches and you make the irrigation and things. So therefore those pieces of land needed to be passed down to someone or the ownership rights started to get divided slightly more individually. Mm. And so therefore you needed to... Um, know whose children was whose and the men needed to know whose child was theirs so therefore the easiest way to do that was to take ownership of the woman also so mm. the l ownership of land came with men's ownership mm. of women and that's kind of the birth of marriage and monogamy in now which is a very recent technology basically or a very recent cultural practice mm. um in terms of human history um and then maybe if you look at some of the divorce rates in the States or the divorce rates here, um, not saying that that's the model version of monogamy and that's the only way it needs to be. Anyway, there's millions of versions of that. Then maybe there's, an, there's one way of looking at it being like, oh, that was a 7,000-year failed project or not failed project, but like its time is over or maybe some of its detrimental effects were too detrimental and we could start testing some other ways. We're not really... So we haven't done much experimenting, yeah. relationship experimenting for 7,000 years. Yeah. So we haven't learnt much, and maybe. Society and yeah. culture have changed <laughs> a little bit, yeah. And so yeah. maybe, yeah, we haven't developed lots of the tools that we might otherwise have um, developed or could go on a pathway to developing that will mean that we have much healthier relationships in general in a broader spectrum or field of relationships. Um, because, it's yeah, it's been on the shelf well, there's been this pre-subscribed thing that you get mm. off the shelf. Mm. Um, lots of things that you might not have talked to your partner about to come with it. Lots of assumptions come with this shiny, shiny box. Yeah. And um, and yeah, that's awesome, and it works, and it's great for people. And there are ways of also looking into that box and still having monogamy, and that's awesome. And then there are, for me, it was a bit of a um, a journey on. Oh, one way of looking into that box for me is to hang out with some of these people that are practicing these things. Maybe be into this kind of different structure and start f and I guess I guess I'm a bit of a person of diving in and so it was kind of a way of getting into the deep end in some ways and floundering around for a while <laughs> and <laughs> and not necessarily coming up yet but still floundering around but yeah um, um, definitely in a much much different um, understanding of feelings and our own responsibilities on feelings than I um, have been and that's been mixed with some of my work and mental health and also um, in relationship work around I mean I think a lot of my old pattern was if someone doesn't like you anymore it's their fault mm. and now I'm very clear that like that's a feeling you're not choosing to have and have that shift is not necessarily of you there might have been a pattern or a pathway or better ways you could have dealt with the communication on that but it's not necessarily that feeling isn't your fault and that's awesome and trying and mm. there's definitely a practice around um reduction of that blame and jealousy and mm. uh, you know um that's still something to be worked on but it's definitely one of the first kind of cliffs the jealousy cliff that i fell off was pretty um <laughs> was first up um mm. a massive thing that's like digging into like it's an intense feeling and then yeah. digging into why you're feeling it and what it's based on is a wild journey because you kind of come up with nothing at the end. Mm. You're like, oh, it's based, It's I'm feeling this because of all these patterns and all of these things that have been told for a very long time. But in terms of a real feeling, in terms of like, did you break an agreement with me? No. Did you, was this something that like, am I disappointed you in a, for a particular piece of your behavior or you as a person or was this your fault once you start asking I guess going through those questions then there's there's kind of not much there and it's just this 
insecurity feeling. Mm. And so it gets, once you're left with just your insecurity feeling, then you've also got something to pretty fruitful to kind of work on. I think the, the most interesting thing for me at the moment that, ke- that not keeps coming up, but has come up a little bit, is around our um, assumptions on what commitment is. Right. And so... Um, Ah, this is hilarious thing. A great um, a sentence that often comes up in Tinder profiles is, "I'm not here for hookups. I'm here for something meaningful." And I'm like, at my current understanding, or like where I'm kind of at in terms of like what commitment is and what a polyamorous or a relationship that um, prioritizes the relationship over what the form of the relationship is at any one time. I find it very interesting that like there has to be that dichotomy between that those hookups and something committed. Like, what is that and why is that a natural divide? And so if you're... I guess I kind of see that in some ways the my approach at the moment to polyamorous relationships is that it does prioritise the relationship and secondarily, whatever form that relationship takes over time is secondary to it. And so therefore, for me, I have a um, conception that it's more committed. Because I'm committed to you, whether we are friends or colleagues or lovers or whatever we are at any point in time. Maybe it might be a multitude of those things, whatever. Those That form can shift, but I'm still committed to having you in my life in a meaningful mm. way. Mm. Whereas I think lots of our um, current monogamous culture is based on like, I would, have, I would like you as a lover and a life partner or not at all. Mm. Or whatever. <laughs> you know, there's an element of that, which... um is one version of yes commitment and then also that in some ways that to me that feels very uncommitted because I'm like I'm here for the form of this I like you but if the form changes then you're out of my life too Mm. and so that's something that's been an interesting thing that's just kind of come up maybe recently for me in terms of people's conception of what commitment Mm. is and and back again to those assumption of rules assumption of what Mm. comes with a relationship and with Mm. like it could be Deeply committed, but it could look like no relationship form that we, I've ever imagined. Yeah. But because you've been through that commitment or whatever you've built, that could be whatever form. Yeah, the way you're speaking about polyamory and and actually um, this parenting, this relationship really with Indigo and um, I guess massaging Indigo's relationship to the world, feel really threaded together in a way that I hadn't expected. Um, yeah. I just, uh, it seems to me that there's a, a big, there's big questions that you're very courageously throwing up for yourself and for all of us around, um, around uh, what ownership is, what relationship looks like, what belonging is, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I guess uh, you seem to, you've sort of articulated that over our time talking too. But I wonder if um, for you whether there's a direct relationship between those two things. Around, sorry, say that again. Oh, sorry, there between are, your, um, yeah, the, the this polyamory kind of, um, yeah. yeah, thing that you're investigating and um, indigo, parenting indigo. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I guess I'm, um, yeah, maybe, and this probably goes into a lot of my work and approach as well. It's like, I'm just not very into rules. <laughs> well, actually, that's wrong. I'm not really into rules that other people have, necessarily made without anyone else's voices or just assuming them whatever they are and i think we assume a bunch of rules and put up with them in our lives um and someone made them at some point um and they most of the rules that we live by were made by someone else in a different period of time rules or patterns or cultural behaviors or techniques Mm. of doing things or practices most of them are adopted from others Mm. and so um I guess I think it's totally because of my kind of privileged and white and male experience of the world. Um, maybe a little bit of my outsiderness as a young person um, have been privileged to and put in positions where it's been safe for me to question some of the rules mm. um, and break those rules um, and get away with it essentially. That's been my experience of life. That's like not many other people necessarily get to have and so um, being able to kind of take that into relationships or an assumption or whatever Indigo's life might be is I think that's a fundamental thing that maybe like 
I guess our current schooling system misses out on because it's also been built on a like an industrial level kind of industrial revolution model of putting people into a set forms of machines. Mm. and playing a role in that society as it is rather than playing a role in making whatever society will be or whatever mm. rules will be um that and increasingly well i mean that is i guess so what i feel is one of the critical kind of skills and experiences of like that shifting that making of the rules um and obviously it comes um i think there's an element of it being a um massive insecurity in the older people which is now me <laughs> very much in some ways i've been like it's you can't afford that world to change too much mm. um because there is a pathway now to as for some people of and for the people with all the power to mm. comfort and to security mm. um and so our security is set up in stasis or things being the same mm. and whilst that's where the security is for most people it's changing radically all the time and has been for a long time and so there's a mismatch there, um, particularly in what young people are set up to, to mm. do or be prepared mm. for mm. Um, in, their, in their world. Um, and so I guess that's the, that might be one of the seemings of terms of like Indigo's development or experience of life is like, yeah, all the rules are up for changing. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for Thanks, your time, man. Ash Hollow. Thanks for being here. It's Thanks for all the um pleasure. like the listening. Oh. It's like it's such a like not many people get asked questions and just the space to answer. Mm. Um that's a real like yeah, awesome thing. Thank you. Oh for we that had again. Such yeah. valuable things to share. Yeah. So mm. thanks for bringing the goods. <laughs> 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 it's us. Cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ash uh since Having that conversation with Ash, um, I am recently about to become a parent and have been inspired myself to uh, raise my, or attempt to raise my child gender creative. Um, I think we talked about it as uh, non-binary, but um, that inspired me to start researching and start looking at what the options were in that space. And I really loved what Ash had to say and um, and followed his link into into the Raising Zuma website and um and yeah, want to explore gender creative parenting myself. So, so I really recommend that you um, that you take this podcast and and yeah, have a have a look at at, at what your relationship is to gender. It's certainly informed mine. Um, if you ah, if you're wanting to keep up with um, what Ash does, then uh, you can contact um, his business through www.spacelamp.nz. But um, yeah, I hope you found that delicious. Remember, of course, that we are just in our first series of the Sex and Space podcast journey, um, but we already have so much uh, under our belt, some amazing interviews that I highly recommend you check out. If you enjoyed this interview, we've got ones on the future of sex education, sex and clowning, ending HIV, uh, indigenous gender and sexuality, sex therapy. There's so many options, so really do have a little hunt around in our um, in our archives of our first season to see what you like. And we'd love to hear from you too. We want to hear what you loved and what you didn't like and 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 your feedback and your ideas and, and things that you think we should be covering, people you think we should be talking to. So you can just check in with us at hello at sexandspace.com. That's hello at sexandspace.com. Hello. Um, and feel free to send us your emails, your pictures, your voice recordings, whatever works for you. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and you can follow us too. Facebook, Instagram at sexandspace.com. That's sexandspace, D-O-T-C-O-M. D-O-T-C-O-M. Yes, and um, those clicks and swipes, if you had any uh, any spare just lying around, um, then if you could see your way to leaving us a five-star review or a rating on uh, Apple Podcasts or any of the other podcast apps, that would be a huge, huge help. Um, we'll be shouting out some of the good ones on future episodes. Uh, massive, massive thanks to all our guests. The good folks at the Armoury Recording Studios in Wellington uh, to the folks at String Theory, to Andrew, Tanya, Brandon, David and Richard for their insanely amazing voices. Uh, many thanks to my co-host, Jessica. Mm, indeed. And thank you to you for making it all the way to the end. Uh, join us next week for more. Bye-bye.
If you found some of this material a little challenging, keep coming back and we'll make it really challenging. <laughs>